Well, hello everyone, and welcome to our session, Reimagining the Future of Hand Hygiene. In today's session, um, we'll share some of the learnings from the Global Hand Washing Partnership. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd like to uh, share a couple of things, a couple of housekeeping items. First, this event is being recorded. The recording will be available after the conference. Uh, please use the chat box in Pathable in the pla in Pathable platform uh, to interact during the session. There we go. So uh, in today's session, we'll have three speakers who will cover um, the different topics of the current state of hand hygiene and what we have learned, hand hygiene habits, and then gender and hygiene. After that, we'll go into breakout groups for discussion um, to really discuss leveraging our current situation and how to progress improvements in hand hygiene. The Global Hand Washing Partnership is a public-private partnership which facilitates Global Hand Washing Day and other advocacy and knowledge management activities through the year. Um, to celebrate progress for universal hand hygiene. Earlier this year, we hosted a hand washing innovations think tank meeting um, with some of the leading thinkers around hand washing. In this session, we will discuss the future of hand hygiene based on the insights and findings from that hand washing innovations think tank. The objectives for this year's think tank be, can be seen on the screen, but they can be boiled down to how do we take our current situation with COVID and leverage it for improving hand hygiene in the future. The think tank meetings are small gatherings. So we're really looking forward to this opportunity to widen the discussion and get your input through the breakout groups. So one of the um, new developments around hand hygiene over the past uh, year and a half has been the launch of the Hand Hygiene for All initiative. And today, uh, one of our first speakers, or our, our first speaker will be um, from that initiative, which is really leading um, through the efforts of WHO and UNICEF, really leading countries in developing roadmaps around hand hygiene to accomplish universal hand hygiene. And so our first speaker is Nat Painter, who's the global coordinator for the Hand Hygiene for All initiative at UNICEF. Nat, over to you. Great, thank you, Ron. And thank you everyone for joining the session today. Not sure whether to wish you good evening, good morning, or good afternoon. So just uh, good day to everyone and really appreciate your time. Uh, as Ron mentioned, I'm the global coordinator for the Hand Hygiene for All initiative. Uh, and this is a program that launched uh, by UNICEF and WHO to really uh, develop a concrete response to COVID-19. Uh, obviously many organizations are working to respond to the situation on the ground, uh, but the role of the Hand Hygiene for All initiative is really uh, to focus on the how governments can take a leadership position on hand hygiene, strengthening their national policies, their strategies, um, financing, things along those lines. Uh, and so this is really a, a, unique, a unique moment uh, in the hand hygiene sector with COVID-19 uh, spreading across the world. Uh, and if we can go to the next slide, uh, I think the main lesson that we saw early on in this uh, pandemic is that when the world was struggling for a response uh, to COVID-19, pretty much all countries had a consistent message of wash your hands with soap. Uh, and this is the immediate response to any uh, public health uh, crisis. Uh, before vaccines are developed, before masks are applied, uh, before social distancing is, is practiced, uh, everyone turns back to washing their hands with soap. Now, despite this strong messaging, we know that there's been a real challenge around uh, sustained hand washing practices. Uh, and if we could go to the next slide, uh, we can talk about the overall framework that we've developed for this. So we know that there are really a tripartite uh, 
components for successful hand hygiene programs. You need a strong uh, national enabling environment uh, to set the policies and strategies and to help facilitate hand hygiene uh, markets. Uh, and then you need a resilient hand hygiene market. We've seen quite a bit of how the market suffered during global, regional, national lockdowns. And then of course you need um, evidence-based behavior change that both instills, excuse me, instills good practice for hand hygiene, as well as generating demand for hand hygiene uh, markets. Um, if we could go to the next slide here. And so um, taking this bit by bit, and we'll hear more about this in just a moment, uh, I feel underqualified to be talking about behavior change when we have Julia Rosenbaum coming on in a moment. Uh, but essentially we saw that there was quite a strong immediate reaction to um, COVID-19 and a sharp uptick in hand hygiene uh, practices. But we also know that this, um, this practice drops off quickly once a crisis passes or frankly, once it becomes normalized. And we've seen a kind of remarkable drop uh, in hand washing um, practices, even in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, we know that, but coming out of this, we see some other key lessons, such as the role of infrastructure in uh, ensuring ongoing behavior change and investing in hygiene facilities makes hand washing easier to, to practice, both as a reminder and as a facility. Um, and that we've also seen that disease information alone is insufficient to change hand hygiene behavior. And we'll be talking a bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, moving on to the next slide, the other key component around this equation between demand and, and supply is ensuring there's, we have resilient hand hygiene markets. Uh, the role of the market and the, and the local market in particular became really quite evident uh, during this crisis uh, as global supply chains were disruptive, disruptive. Uh, and yet we, we'd seen how historic neglect of water systems limited the uh, availability of water and hindered the ability to practice uh, hand hygiene. Uh, the disrupted supply chains also impacted the availability of uh, hand hygiene facilities, uh, be it tippy taps or bespoke technologies. Uh, and that limited access to raw materials also inhibited local soap manufacturing. But even despite those challenges and disruptions, the pandemic also gave rise to opportunities for local innovations. And we've seen uptakes in, in development of new technologies for hand hygiene that can be rapidly deployed uh, to emergency situations. Uh, please go to the next slide. And then looking at the national level at the enabling environment, uh, we've seen a, a number of the challenges that the countries have faced uh, in responding to the uh, global pandemic, as well as the opportunities to prepare for the next one. So for example, while majority of countries have policies and plans for hygiene, they often lack sufficient human and financial resources to implement the plans. Uh, for example, 73% uh, of 109 glass uh, survey respondents had national hygiene plans before COVID-19, but only five of those countries had uh, hygiene plans which were fully financed. And we certainly know how um, hand hygiene is often neglected from in the funding uh, area. Uh, there's also a real challenge with governments neglecting to consider infrastructure investments when they think about uh, hygiene. And there has been a historic focus on behavior change. Behavior change is a critical part of the hand hygiene equation, but without the basic infrastructure of water supply or hand hygiene facilities, uh, it would be severely hampered in um, uptake of the hand hygiene behavior. So strong encouragement for pre-investment uh, in the infrastructure um, uh, component of it. Uh, and then the last area I'd like to uh, emphasize here is that the real cross-sectoral nature of hand hygiene. I think we find that true of most components of the wash sector. Uh, but hand hygiene really straddles um, the private uh, environment of homes, public spaces, in markets and transportation hubs, not to mention education facilities, uh, healthcare facilities, prisons, barracks. And so there's a real need for an apex organization to drive the overall uh, coordination of hand hygiene. So moving on to the next slide, we see that we're really at the intersection of urgency and opportunity. Uh, the pandemic continues in much of the world, uh, actually in, in all, not just much of the world, in, in all of the world as we start facing the Delta variant uh, and the challenges of ensuring uh, universal vaccination. Uh, and of course, the persistent respiratory and diarrheal diseases continue, which have been, historically been the focus of hand hygiene for all. And we can also assume there's another uh, health crisis uh, in the future. 
So really the time is now uh, to invest in hand hygiene and to instill those hand hygiene habits. Because once the crisis is upon us, it becomes a real challenge to pivot quickly uh, and to roll out widespread hand hygiene programs. So thank you for your attention. Uh, and with that, I'd like to pass it over to uh, Julia Rosenbaum, who will take us through uh, some of the discussions around um, behavior change. Uh, Julia Rosenbaum uh, is a senior behavior change specialist at FHI 360, and I'll pass it to you, Julia. Thanks so much, Nat. Um, and as Nat's really uh, paved the way, I'm gonna focus in now on hand washing behavior and how habit science can help to sustain the COVID spurred gains in hand washing. Next slide, please. So with the outbreak of COVID, we've seen a spike in hand washing as never before. At the peak of the epidemic, people reported that they hand washed repeated times a day as a COVID prevention measure. They washed at new junctions, like when they arrived at home, after handling groceries multiple times a day. So the innovation think tank took on the question, what approaches might apply to maintain these high rates of hand washing that are still high, but as Nate said, they're all, Nate said they're already starting to decline, but still high. And so we looked at the science, next slide please. We looked at the science of habit formation to build on recent work on hand washing habit formation and what we might apply. So first, and briefly to help you engage in the discussion, what do we mean by habits? Do you ever find yourself saying, I'm on autopilot? That you go through the motions of a behavior without even thinking. Well, those are habits. Putting on a seatbelt, driving or cycling to work or to the market, cooking certain foods, checking apps like Facebook on your phone when you turn off your cell phone alarm first thing in the morning. Those are habits. And when you first started those behaviors, like using cell phone apps, you really had to think about doing the behavior and learning the steps to those cell phone apps. But now you just do it. In fact, about half of our daily behaviors are habitual and they're guided by cues. They're less conscious, almost automatic. They're most frequently performed. Um, habits are most often a frequently performed behavior. And they're performed in what's called a stable context the same place, often the same time or times that happen. And our habit system is not very responsive to motivation or goals, to long-term rewards or, or verbalized rules. Instead, it's really a cue-driven system that we learn incrementally over time through repetition. Habits can really be quite contextual, like responding to a handshake. Just think how that has changed how we needed to break this habit under COVID conditions of just extending a hand on meeting someone. If we had to think and decide before every action, we'd really be exhausted before we left the house in the morning. So those habits are controlled by a different part of the, the brain than what we call goal-driven behaviors, things that we decide about. Think of habits as more reflexive or reflex on autopilot as opposed to goal-driven, which are reflective. Before we get to the particulars, it's really worth noting that habit is often a misused term used in the vernacular when referring to consistent and correct practice of a behavior like hand washing. I'm gonna make that a habit. But engaging those habit formation principles is very different from promoting consistent and correct practice, which is also vital to hand washing. Those are the broader evidence-based techniques that Nat referred to. And we have a different set of a different and complementary set of approaches to do that too. So our question, both for the think tank and today in our group is how can we build on habit science to maintain the momentum, to keep the practice of hand washing going? And so before you, in the think tank, we introduced the principles of habit formation applied to hand washing, principles that were developed a few years back when we engaged Dr. David Neal to apply his work to hand washing. And he extracted six principles that are there before you on the slide that are arranged roughly in sequence with the first two as preconditions of change, ensuring a supportive environment, as Nat pointed out, which may be policy, capacity, and finance, but as applied to habit formation, you need the stuff immediately and consistently available, running water, soap, or agent, and sanitizer, you need it there. 
for habits, we leverage context. You target people when existing habits have been temporarily disrupted by a larger context change, like pregnancy or moving. Or you can piggyback them, piggyback a new practice onto an existing behavior, like food preparation or mirror use, primping. Principles three and four address trial or early adoption. We want to eliminate friction. We want to limit choice as much as we can, reduce the steps, identify small doable actions. And importantly, we want to provide a cueing system that remind or nudge that behavior. And then lastly, those principles five and six, particularly um, the, the fifth one, are really about addressing maintenance or stickiness of the behavior. We want to encourage practice, which actually builds a pathway in the brain to that automatic behavior. And we want to promote meaning and motivation around the behavior. So next slide, please. So during the think tank, we delved into those principles, but with our COVID lens on, and we identified some key takeaways that I'm going to jog through now, and then we can discuss in the breakout groups. So for ensuring a supportive enabling environment, our think tech group noted that the junctures or times for hand washing are different during COVID, particularly hand washing after coming home. So we're really going to need to focus on how to assure that facilities are available for these new junctures if we want to maintain it. In my home, I put a big bottle of sanitizer by the door, but in countries without running water, uh, in developing country settings, you might want to put a hand washing station. On levering, leveraging context, Certainly, COVID provided a context change for all of us. Many work from home now. We stopped many of our daily activities and started some new ones. We had a disruption to anchor the new hand washing behavior. And eliminating friction to really look at what makes it hard to hand wash at each of those junctions. Placing hand washing stations or sanitizer makes it easier to do the behavior. New norms around hand washing also help to eliminate friction. You arrive at a place and you're asked, did you wash? That's no longer an outlier question. Or passing around a squirt of sanitizer indicates that there's now a supportive social norm which eliminates friction. On to the last slide. Providing ownable cues is a really big one for making hand washing a habit. And you probably noted that the supportive environment, the first, and eliminating friction can also provide cues or nudges to wash. So walking in the door and seeing that sanitizer or putting a germ sticker or some kind of reminder right on that front door, these are cues that nudge the behavior and they help to make it a habit. They're what behavioral economists might call choice architecture where you actually manipulate that physical space arranged to unconsciously guide people to doing the desired behavior. Number five and quite vital to habit formation is encouraging practice. It's supported by the other principles with a supportive environment and multiple cues. Hand washing at these new junctures like coming home can start to become habits. And then that pathway in the brain starts to form through practice. And then the last principle as it relates to making hand washing a habit is promoting meaning and motivation. So in the think tank, we learned about the difference between behavioral motivators and emotional motivators. Behavioral motivators like nurture, social status, or affiliation might be more useful in long term, in the long term, to form hand washing habits and to create more universal rather than context specific motivation. Short term emotions like fear have an opposite effect on habits, but they may in fact be useful when you make self efficacy, when you dress, I can do this thing, there's something I can do closely linked to fear. There's something tangible I can do right now. So with that, I hope this provides some food for thought to bring to the breakout sessions. And with that, I'm gonna hand the, the mic or the presentation over to my colleague, Anita Bartel from UNICEF, who's gonna to talk to us about gender and hygiene. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Anita, and I'm working for UNICEF uh, headquarters and the Watch Team in New York. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here um, on behalf of uh, the team that organized the gender and hygiene session um, at the Think Tank. Um, and I'm really excited to share just some highlights and some key um, takeaway and discussion points that we had 
um, during during this session. We started really off with a big question mark. How do we address the gap between the ambition and reality when it comes to um, gender and hygiene programming? Um, so the ambition is very clear to contribute with every hygiene program um, that we design and implement to gender equality. Um, but reality often looks very different. So I want to share a couple of key points. Um, first, we spoke about um, the difference between sex and gender specific differences in hygiene behaviors. And I think that's an important distinction um, to make because there are sex specific um, needs um, that are different between men and women. So hygiene during and postpartum, menstrual hygiene, um, including the hand washing and the washing of materials and the management of incontinence, uh, which affects women um, at a much higher rate than men. And then there are the gender specific aspects of hygiene, for example, who provides water for households um, to wash their hands, um, their feet, their, um, their clothes, their bodies. Uh, who's responsible for washing dependents um, hands um, and and then those the key times that we often talk about with with hand washing uh, are really piggybacking on behaviors that are typically performed by women or girls so for example changing diapers preparing food so it's not a long way to, uh, away from from when when someone someone here is um, like wash your hands before changing a diaper after changing a diaper or before preparing food they will say oh that's not me. That's not my role. Um, so really, this is a this is not this is a way of like how do we reach everyone with our programming? Um, so with that difference, sort of really clearly um, looking at the gender specific difference, we looked at a couple of programming examples how hygiene programming has used gender norms and gender roles um, in its programming. Specifically, we discussed the concept of the intervention Super Amma or Super Mom, which was tested in India as a proof of concept that behavior could be changed by only appealing to emotional drivers. Um, so no knowledge, um, no skills. In this case, um, the emotional driver was nurture and care for children. The message was simple. Um, be a super mom, help your child to become successful in life by instilling good habits of hand washing early on. So show your love through a bar of soap. Until now, um, it's one of the most successful behavior change, um, hygiene behavior change programming um, out there. Um, it resonates with families and communities. Um, it's not controversial. Um, it had a very clear, very simple message. Yet there's the flip side. Um, of that, and this is quite literally the other side of the coin. It resonates with families and communities, means that it exactly replicated um, prevalent gender roles um, in its uh, in its storyline, and thereby attaching the desired behavior, which is hand washing, to a gender gendered role that is based on deep rooted inequalities. On top of that, such a narrative connects parents' behavior, particularly mothers' behavior, to their children's health and life outcomes, which might induce a significant uh, amount of stress and harmful guilt and shame on parents. Implicitly, the story also propagates um, a certain vision of parenting, putting the mother-child diet at the center and leaving out, for example, the influence of community and peers um, or any other important reference group um, is left out of this picture. So while it was very effective in um, in triggering the behavior change um, and a quite sustainable behavior change, it, there was also the the big um, potential harm that it had on the short run, but also on the long run. But I don't just want to paint a bleak picture. We discussed how we can tweak and overhaul the approach um, to make it more gender neutral if not gender transformative, along with discussing underlying tensions between short-term behavior change and long-term social change. I group the key takeaways from this discussion in two parts, and we are really curious to hear your further thoughts and ideas on these points, and also examples of programs um, that any of you in the audience have worked on that may have used any of these approaches or um, other approaches that worked well for you. In terms of program design, we had identified a few different angles to approach gender and hygiene. The first angle is inspired by private sector 
advertising, which sometimes has a very sophisticated way of detecting and building on latent aspirations and emerging trends regarding social norms, including gender norms, and build on these to amplify them. We've seen, for example, a range of very excellent advertising challenging gender norms related to menstruation in recent years. The second angle we have used, we have used, we have seen used during the COVID-19 pandemic extensively is um, instead of appealing to values and behaviors attached to a certain social role, uh, during the pandemic, we've often seen um, very strong messages of we're in this together. Um, so appealing to, to joint values and joint humanity. The third and fourth angle are mirroring each other. So gender transformative hygiene programming should always start with addressing wash-related um, gender norms. And on the other hand, um, we should explore ways to include hygiene into larger gender transformative programming, for example, community parroting programming or boys club that speak about masculinity um, and so on. But for all of these angles, one thing is the most important. Listen and be responsive to community needs and aspirations. Um, that's not a new insight from the think tank, um, but it's indispensable um, always to emphasize that. Uh, in terms of program design, um, agile management is the big buzzword, um, but what we really discussed is um, what com it comes down to um, building in time to pause and reflect, to think about um, and to collect data on unintended consequences, ensuring um, there's a feedback mechanism from the community, etc., um, to really not, um, not have a blind spot in your programming. Second, the relatively short time frame of WASH programs often stands in a stark contrast uh, to the time, sometimes uh, a few generations, that it takes to transform gender roles. That doesn't mean we shouldn't start somewhere, but it means that um, there's a big need um, that it all um, be coordinated well, and we need to be realistic about how transformative programs can really be within their time frame. And finally, similar to the point above, work with partners, governments, communities to lead the change in their own communities. With this, I've reached the end of the brief synthesis of this think tank discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the further discussion. Back over to you, Ron. Well, thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, you shared in a brief time um, some very important elements that were discussed during the Ham Washing Innovations Think Tank. Um, but now we would like all of you participants to, um, to consider some of these same issues that we considered during the Think Tank. Uh, but building on uh, what's been presented today, but also be going beyond that. And so we are going to break out into breakout groups uh, and we will have the question of what concrete steps should be taken to enact change and accelerate, accelerate progress toward universal hand hygiene. Uh, and that includes steps to address uh, the approaches presented in these earlier presentations on gender issues, habit development, strengthening the enabling environment and strengthening hygiene markets, and also evidence-based uh, behavior change approaches. And so now um, through the magic of um, the uh, Zoom, uh, we will all be flown into our breakout groups and there'll be a facilitator in each group to lead that discussion and then to make sure that we report back from those breakout groups uh, in plenary for the end of this session. So look forward to talking to you there. Hi, everyone. Um, 
wait just a minute to make sure that we're all back here as we get going. So um, at this point, um, we will be um, sharing uh, the discussions from the breakout groups. And uh, Nat, maybe I, uh, we can start with you. Uh, can you share uh, some of the last ones that my group. camera on? Uh, great. So thank you, uh, Ron. Had a good uh, talk uh, on the in reaction to the um, to the presentations. Really, we focus primarily on the enabling environment uh, question. Uh, although I think all members of this would agree that it's not the the single solution, but perhaps a, a key barrier to scaling up uh, hand hygiene and developing sustainable programs. Uh, one of the areas that came out uh, pretty clearly in the conversation is really the need for an, an apex agency uh, to help coordinate uh, and have overall accountability uh, for hand hygiene, whereas sp specific other ministries or departments would have responsibility for prisons, public spaces, uh, schools, uh, whereas the Apex Agency may well be the Ministry of Health, uh, and they wouldn't necessarily have, uh, you know, their hands in the uh, prison uh, environment or the refugee context, but rather they would have the overall responsibility for ensuring that those other agencies are moving forward uh, within their own um, within their own mandate. Uh, and I think there's one of the challenges that we didn't get into, so this is just my opinion. Uh, is I've, I have found that, that agencies and, and ministries tend to be a, a bit territorial. Uh, and so it might be a, a challenge to have those ministries, you know, uh, the opposite of devolving, I guess, evolving the responsibility or accountability upwards towards an apex agency, which, which seems to be against the trends of uh, devolution and, and decision-making. But I think there's probably a line that we could walk. Uh, if my... Colleagues have anything to add? I'm, they're, they're not a shy lot, so I'm sure they'll uh, raise their hand or, or shout out. But in the meantime, back to you, Ron. Okay, does anybody else have anything to add from that group's discussion? All right, well, thank you. And um, over to Julia's group. Thanks. I'll just highlight a few things and then others from the group, please jump in. I think I'll just follow the order, but thinking about the enabling environment, which we really did spend a lot of our airtime on, um, the real need, again, to get health behind this, um, that uh, we were also dealing with both metrics and actions, but sort of, you know, how many sessions like this are taking place at health events, not at wash events came up, and the need to really lobby global health stakeholders on this, the World Health Assembly, the, and to get sort of a rallying cry around that as well. Um, we didn't, we talked a bit at the Innovation Think Tank, we, we said we really do have this need for a rallying cry of, of, that people can get behind. Um, in the group sort of tying between enabling environment and then also sort of markets, um, we had the issue too about Big market, how do we deal with water and soap? And you know, water is a big issue, but soap, just dealing with the hygiene markets of sort of micro loans to women to start up a soap business and promote through network, you know, smaller networks. So we discussed an immediate action there of attending to both the big and the small hygiene markets. Um, thinking about, I'm going, if you will, around the WHO UNICEF framework, thinking about the, that behavior change, evidence-based behavior change, um, thinking through about doing the more interpersonal versus sort of mass media blitz and what's the payoff of, of each of those or the of, of right mixes. Um, so we spent a little bit of time looking at, at um, just again, how to get the, the bang for the buck as far as um, building on COVID right now. Um, how to scale it up and amp it up. And then I think another th final thing I'll say and then ask the group was, you know, the need to really look at those positive outliers like Swash Bharat, you know, how can you, for all the issues around there, but that, you know, how does that challenge other countries? So um, to really start highlighting success, whether it's in, um, global south countries or 
even someone someone's talking about Portugal, you know, the past 20 years. And sadly, we have a real lack of data, even find some of those positive outliers, but they need to do that. Um, we talked about so much more. I'm trying to do this sort of in an organized way. Anything else from the group that felt urgent that I didn't bring in? Inclusion, that was the other, that when we talk about gender, also to also look at inclusion and inclusion also can tie with access to markets and infrastructure and all sorts of, of inclusive issues. Anything else from my group? Thanks, all. Okay, thank you. And Emily, um, are you ready to present? Sure. Okay, great. So uh, basically, uh, to build off the enabling environment portion, we basically both Malawi, where Sison, who was in our group, and I'm in Vanuatu, both of us are in that process of developing a roadmap or implementation plan, perhaps around the hand hygiene for all initiative. So we actually talked mostly about the habit part of it um, and, and the evidence base, trying to find some more options for habit formation because we kind of all agreed that perhaps there was some short-term fear that created a new, new construction, new infrastructure, and maybe new access was created. But after that, how can we create, well, like you said, that unconscious mind to create the long-term habits we didn't feel like any of us had come along, you know, what some answers there. I mentioned that in Vanuatu, the government tried the footprints in many different ways. We've done it with pathways and with um, paint on spray paint and all and tiles and all sorts of different things, but none of them has quite worked that same way. It's still easy to walk past or they rub away really quickly or they just get ruined. Like it's, it's not that easy. The, the one study had such a good exp experience in Bangladesh schools and we haven't been able to replicate that. So if there's other grand brainstorms, um, that's where we are still kind of looking for that. How do you create that long-term habit? So that's a lot what we talked about. Saison, okay. Ron, anything to add? Um, Saison, anything? You know, I'll ask this question to Julia. Um, you know, so we did have that discussion about how fear is important at this time uh, mm -hmm. in changing behavior, but I'd like for you to chime in on that and um, thoughts about how to take that situation and make it where we can have lasting behavior change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just briefly, a lot of the evidence around fear campaigns come from the earlier days of HIV and the Grim Reaper kinds of fear campaigns. And the work of someone named Kim Witte, W-I-T-T-E at Hopkins, has she's done a, a lot of work over the years. But what she really dissected and what's so useful for me is that when fear is just put in the forefront alone, you might spur some immediate action, but people usually they push away fear. And we're incredibly sophisticated that way to just block. So we'll take that immediate action sometimes, but then we do everything we can to just rationalize our way around it. But when you actually couple fear with what I was saying, self-efficacy, there's something I can do now. So it's like, yes, COVID, but the hand washing. And I think that's why hand washing, masking is another story, but you know, there were some resistors, but overall, again, pretty good uptake. And you saw people doing social distancing, not hundred percent, but like we never saw before, because that was that self-efficacy. There's something I can do now. And that's when fear can really work. But you just have to make sure it's so closely coupled. You can't have them sort of dispersed even in different messaging. And then you feel good, like, okay, this is what I can do now. So that's kind of the basic behind fear can be motivating in the very short term, but it doesn't, it, the data show it, it doesn't last. And we can go beyond HIV. They have played it out, of course, in all kinds of other areas, but the HIV provided sort of the richest of data. Thanks for that, Ron. Thank you. And Nat, I have a question out of this whole discussion. You know, um, here's a couple of countries that are addressing uh, hand hygiene roadmaps. What's some important things for uh, countries to remember as they're developing hand hygiene roadmaps to achieve universal hand hygiene? Yeah, thanks, Ron. Uh, that's the million dollar question. Uh, I would say, I mean, I, I might not answer your question, but I'll give the answer I want. How about that? Uh, so basically, I mean, what we're seeing with the roadmaps is 
we don't get much traction if we try to force it. So basically it's trying to focus uh, and to work on countries where uh, there are potential traction within the refugee context within schools program or, or something along those lines, an initiative where there's already momentum that we can build upon. Uh, and then to expand that to grow from, all right, universal school hand hygiene would still be a, a considerable success, but use that to build to universal healthcare hand hygiene and public spaces hand hygiene. Uh, and to have that starting with that, that kernel of, of success to really grow it over time. Uh, I think the other area that's really critical to that success program, maybe two, two components to that. One is the uh, ensuring of, of you know, the whole system in the room, making sure all the stakeholders are together and, and working uh, towards a common purpose. Uh, and then the other area that um, I don't think we spend nearly enough time on is paying for it. Uh, the looking for financing, uh, identifying what is the cost uh, of this? What, it, what is included in hand hygiene budgets and what aren't? Uh, we know that access to water is really almost a make or break uh, for hand hygiene, but that cost is almost never included. We talk about the incremental cost of, you know, at the half a liter per family per week or what have you for the hand hygiene, but the basic infrastructure, that investment needs to be uh, accounted for uh, and brought into the, into the costing of this, um, in, in my opinion. Uh, but then you run into this challenge of, oh my God, this price tag suddenly becomes enormous. But without those components being costed, I, I think it's really going to be undervalued uh, and under budgeted. Um, so let me, I, I don't think I answered your question, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you for that, Matt. Um, and Julia, I'm, I'm going to ask you just a very, very quick question. Um, you know, we have this classical nudge of um, the footsteps at the school, um, but yet in Vanuatu, those footsteps rub off very quickly. That has not been a successful nudge. Any thoughts there on alternatives? Um, for the actual nudges in schools, um, we fiddled quite a bit in Ethiopia working with the Splash Group, for those of you who know the Seattle-based Splash, with the same problems. We played with things like auto paint or paints that are more durable paints that are made for outside. And so that's some promise you'd have to check and there's also availability. And also using like bricks, actual something that's a colored little ducky path, some, anything that stands out, but that is a bit more resilient. So. Very specific. Those were two things that we came up with. And then I'm all for these innovation challenges, like ask people. And they really usually come up with some really cool things. You may have done that already, but especially kids, you know, they're inventive, they're doing stuff all the time, but just ask. Um, we also have been trying to figure out how do you bring nudges to hand washing nudges to the home? And that's where I don't have answers. But again, this is my own little innovation challenge. But we do have at least some good data about how to do it in schools. And others, there's a a nice literature now, but it's sort of the essence of like ducky prints that lead. So you, you have these bright, colorful, fun prints that people follow and that's shown to be quite effective in having colorful hand washing stations. And again, with Splash, we didn't, for other reasons, we didn't get to carry out the actual research activity, but we're looking things like a, a cutting board to, with reminders for, you know, did you wash and we could also tie in some food hygiene without complicating, but, you know, what are those nudges at home? And under COVID, we also saw things like just danglers literally right in front of your face when you walk in the door. Um, we don't have them, but we are trying to sort of play around. And again, anyone who wants to play around and measure it, um, we could, I'm sure, get together a nice little group to try and, and advise and set something up where we could do some measurement of that at homes. Okay. If anyone wants to put in the chat, they might have other ideas. I see we're running low on time. So Ron, back to you. Yes, well, thank you to everybody. Um, great discussion today. And we look forward to all working together to um, work towards universal hand hygiene. Uh, we will be um, uh, in, there's a couple of our sessions on hand hygiene later in the conference. Uh, so we hope that you'll join those. Uh, with our partners. And um, also, uh, we have the Think Tank report, which we just published on Friday. And so that's available at the Global Handwashing Partnership website. 
just go to our resources link and search for the Think Tank report and you are able to download it there. Uh, and in addition, we will be um, placing on the Paffable link uh, the slides from today's um, presentations. Um, if we're able to do that from a technology standpoint, we'll see. So anyway, I uh, just want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you for this great discussion. Thank you for all of your uh, efforts and work um, on the part of hand hygiene. So thank you much. Enjoy the conference. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.